Some pieces in contemporary Japanese music are harmonically eyebrow raising, or dare I say it, even spicy. These chord progressions take longer harmonic journeys before reaching home with more drama and intrigue and maybe backflips and somersaults before arriving on the one. For me, these are often more interesting because there's some surprises from our ear or some setting up of expectations and then subversion of those expectations. Often these stranger non-diatonic chords set up for the chord that immediately follows them. Today I'd like to do an overview of these explorative chords, which I'm broadly characterizing as transition chords. In this video we're going to cover secondary dominance, tritone substitution, backdoor two fives, and modulation. The song we'll be analyzing together today in order to tie it all together is called Fuyu Momiji, and it's by a talented Japanese composer in Kashiwa Marumochi. Shout out to Nyakai from my Discord for showing this song to me. I actually got a chance to chat with Kashiwa-san and ask a few questions about the song. So I'll be including that in this video as well. So off we go. Let's learn some of the tools that we need in order to understand what's going on in Fuyu Momiji. <laughs> Secondary dominant chords. Secondary dominant chords are a simple tool that we can use to expand our harmonic palette in a really interesting way. As I've taught in previous videos, one of the most fundamental aspects of Western music theory is this concept of five resolving to one. With secondary dominant chords, we extend that concept to say, if I'm trying to arrive at any target chord, I can do so in a satisfying way from the dominant chord of fifth above it. And that's regardless of whether that dominant chord of fifth above it is in the parent key. That's the secondary part in secondary dominance. When we label a secondary dominant chord, we call it the five of whatever chord it's leading to. And we indicate that with a slash. So we say the five of six, for example. On the classical side, this is called tonicization, in which we take our target chord and we treat it as if it were the tonic. So in other words, we're implying a different key for a little while. One piece where we see secondary dominance used in Ocarina of Time is in the theme for Kakariko Village. There's a 5 of 2 at the end of the A section. And in the B section, there's a 5 of 2 and a 5 of 4. When I hear a secondary dominant chord in context, it definitely sticks out to my ear and adds a little bit of extra tension. But when we arrive to the target chord that it sets up for, it makes that arrival that much more satisfying. There's that much more tension that's released by us arriving there. It's sort of like arriving at this spot instead of like this, more of a like that. I know that wasn't very loud. I'm wearing like rubber slippers. It can be a good way to explain certain borrow chords if they are immediately followed by a diatonic chord that's a fifth below them. For example, in a major context, a major three chord can be labeled as a five of six, and a major six chord can be labeled as a five of three. And also a major two, or particularly a dominant two chord, can be labeled as a five of five chord where appropriate. So just to like how we can normally chain perfect cadences together to make 5-1 into 2-5-1 and even 6-2-5-1, one, 
we can do this in a secondary context as well. Um, and instead of just doing five of x, then x, we can do two of x, five of x, then x, or a six two five of x, etc. Or even cooler, we can go five of five of x, then five of x, then x. So all we're doing there is taking the two chord of a two five and making it into a five of five. We actually see a secondary two five in One Summer's Day by Joe Hisaishi. I want to shout out Potato in Despair from my YouTube comments for pointing out the use of secondary dominance in One Summer's Day. Okay, so now things get a little bit more interesting. These devices I'm about to go into are a little rarer, so what I'm going to do is in each case I'm going to provide three examples so that we can get the sound in our ear, because you probably haven't heard this that many times. If we take a G chord and put it in first inversion when we're trying to arrive at C, now we can arrive there with smoother bass movements because the bass only has to move from B to C instead of G to C. It's just one half step up, right? We can do this in a secondary context as well and invert our secondary dominant chord to approach our target chord from a half step below. M2U and Nikod's song Loon from the game Demo uses an inverted secondary dominant chord in order to reach the sixth chord. Shout out to Dexter from my Discord for sharing this song. There's a song from the Studio Ghibli film Porco Rosso with this long name. It's um, Poki ni wa Mukashi no Hanashio. Um, and it actually has two of these inverted secondary dominant chords in quick succession. So let's check that out. And Gurenge from Demon Slayer uses this in a cool way too. But wait, what's this? Tabitha and Thomas from Test the Divide for a super cool metal cameo example? The 7 diminished 7 chord. Another way of arriving at a target chord is by using a diminished 7 chord a half step below it. And to be honest, for this one, I generally think about it more in terms of voice leading than in terms of function. Uh, so for example, if we're using B diminished 7 to get to C, it happens to be that all the notes of B diminished 7 are a half step away from notes that we arrive at in C. The B steps up a half step to arrive at C. The F goes down a half step to E, and the A flat goes down a half step to G. If we want to think about it functionally though, we can say that we're tonicizing the target chord not by borrowing the 5 chord from the parallel Ionian, but by borrowing the 7 diminished 7 chord from the parallel harmonic minor. And for that reason, when I come across this in analysis, I like to use the shorthand of 7 diminished 7 of X. Let me first demonstrate the idea with a jazz example from Lawrence's Do Nothing With Me. So there's this interesting aspect to inverting diminished 7 chords, and it makes F diminished 7 equivalent to A flat diminished 7, which is also equivalent to B diminished 7, and also equivalent to D diminished 7. And because of this, we can sort of think about approaching our target chord using any inversion of this seven diminished seven chord. The opening thing from Hoseki no Kuni uses this. And 
here's an example of a progression that uses it twice. The dominant flat nine chord. Okay, so we are in the home stretch of this part, I promise, but I wanted to point out something really cool about flat nine chords. Here's a jazz example that shows the sound quite nicely. It introduces some pretty cool tension, right? We'll check this out. If we take a G7 flat nine and take the G out, what are we left with? Yeah, that's right, we have a B diminished seven. So because of this, G7 flat nine gravitates towards C, both from this angle of G wanting to resolve down to C and from the angle of B diminished seven wanting to resolve to C. That's a lot of connective tissue with your target chord. I actually use the more diminished usage of a flat nine chord in Minchip. Not that I knew that I was doing that. I think literally I just heard it in Strasbourg and thought it sounded cool and I wanted to experiment with it. And now my friends, yes, the time has come. We have everything that we need in order to understand the great fairy fountains theme. Okay, so this section got super long, so let's review the three devices I covered. The first one is the five dominant of X. The second one is the seven diminished seven of X. And the third one is the five seven flat nine of X, which kind of does both actually. To tie it back, Fuyu Momiji uses some secondary dominance in the A section. But what's this F7 chord doing here? I'm glad you asked, because that'll be in our next section about tritone substitution. But first, let's take a break from all this theory, man. Ah. Mm. 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 Kaisura, where we take a brief pause from all this nerdery to sit down and talk with the composer. I'd like to ask you about the inspiration and composition process for Fuyu Momiji. Did the chords come first, or the melody? The title means autumn leaves in winter, right? When I was writing this song, it was winter and I tried to expand on that image in some way. I recall that the melody and the chords sort of came out at the same time. I thought it'd be good to make the intro a kind of motif and end the song with it too, but beyond that I didn't think too deeply about it. Your harmony in this piece is super explorative. Have you studied much music theory? Do you compose professionally? I didn't study it formally, but I used to listen to piano compositions from composers that I liked and analyze them by copying them by ear. Composition is a complete hobby, and I have no intention of becoming a professional. Who are some of your favorite composers? Your playing reminds me a lot of Hiromi. Is she a composer you look up to? I like Hiromi-san, but she's really advanced, so I haven't been able to embody her style yet. I'm really influenced by Seiji Anse. If you want to listen to his song Fuyu Momiji in full, I've linked it in the description. Currently, the only commercially available version of the song is on this album of duets that Kashiwa did with a saxophonist named Sumika. Uh, the album is called Otono Jisho, which means Dictionary of Sound. I went ahead and got it, and whoa, it's really good. All right, 
Let's dive back into some theory. Remember how we were trying to figure out what the role of that F7 was in the A section of Fuyumomiji? Yeah, like what's going on there? Tritone substitution. Tritone substitution stems from a simple observation about the symmetry of the diminished fifth. In a dominant chord, the three and the flat seven are a tritone apart. In G7, for example, B is a tritone away from F. The tension created by this tritone wants to resolve to C and E, and this is kind of the nucleus of the tension of a dominant chord that wants to lead down to the tonic. In essence, the observation is that if we send the bass note down a tritone to C sharp, the roles of F and B swap, but their relationship stays the same. Because of this, in addition to approaching any target chord using a dominant chord a fifth above it, we can approach any target chord using a dominant chord a half step above it. The resulting chord introduces even more tension before arriving at our target chord. Believe it or not, this actually occurs twice in Zelda's Lullaby. And you know what? Actually, the Cascade Kingdom theme from Super Mario Odyssey has multiple instances of it too. You may be familiar with related classical terms for what's called an augmented sixth chord. Um, there's the Italian augmented sixth chord, and the German augmented sixth chord, and the French augmented sixth chord. I think there's even the Swiss augmented sixth chord. And yes, we are finally here. There is what Ongaku Concept calls the Japanese augmented sixth chord, or the black adder chord. Functionally, to me, all of these can be described as different voicings of a tritone subbed secondary dominant chord. The Italian augmented sixth chord is just a tritone subbed secondary dominant chord with no fifth. The German augmented sixth chord is just a plain vanilla tritone subbed secondary dominant chord. The French augmented sixth chord is a tritone subbed secondary dominant with a flat five. The Japanese augmented sixth chord, or I'll say it again, the black adder chord, is a tritone subbed secondary dominant chord with a nine, no third, and a flat five. These are all super cool chords to use in your composition. Um, and even though the names might sound a little silly, especially because they all function kind of in the same way, it's useful to have these names for specific voicings of a certain device. So for example, if we're talking about B sus seven and A over B, that's a very specific voicing of a B sus seven compared to the standard voicing of a B sus seven. Or compare an A over B to an A major seven over B. Oh, and while we're here, the black adder chord is sick. And this is my favorite example of it. Backdoor two five. Okay, stick with me here because our last two items are a lot shorter. Later in Fuyu Momiji, Kashiwa uses a fairly uncommon chord progression referred to in jazz as the backdoor 2-5. This is a particular form of modal interchange in which instead of resolving down by a fifth to a major chord, the dominant chord in a 2-5 resolves up a whole step to a major chord. With reference to the target chord, what's really going on is a minor 4 
to a flat 7 7 to 1. And in that, the minor 4 and the flat 7 7 are borrow chords from the parallel minor. Similar to flat 6, flat 7, 1, which is the progression I talked about in my modal interchange video. When we borrow chords from the parallel minor, it makes the tonic that much brighter when we arrive at it. Here's a Stevie Wonder example just to get it in your ear. Chan also uses it in fall. And now with that context, let's check out Kashiwa's use of a backdoor 2-5 here. I'm sure they exist, but do you guys know any other contemporary Japanese songs that use backdoor 2-5s like this? Um, I think Fuyu Momiji is the first one that I've heard. If you think you know any, maybe hit me up in the comments here. Now beyond temporarily implying another key, we can make our harmonic journeys even more interesting by actually going to new keys for a while. Fuyu Momiji actually does this a lot, and to my ear, it actually goes through nine keys over the course of the song, which is crazy. I mean, look at this key change map I made, man. It's like all over the place. As we can see from that map, though, all the modulations are either along the circle of fifths or they're chromatic modulations, so they're not actually that hard to figure out. Let's look at what I call the B prime section, which to my ear goes through four keys. I definitely don't think we should overthink this section and be like, this chord means this and that chord means that, um, when really in broader strokes, we're just arriving at one new key at the ends of the section in a kind of a colorful way. But I wanna break down a little bit of what's happening. Modulation up by a fourth. Of the eight modulations in the piece, five of them are up by a fourth. Those familiar with my channel have seen me talk about how modulating up by a fourth is all over the place in contemporary Japanese music. For those who are unfamiliar with the idea, here's a quick example. Put briefly, this is generally a really smooth modulation because all it involves is adding one flat. Modulation up by a half or whole step. Next, I'll explain the two instances where Kashiwa modulates up by a half step. This is a technique used relatively commonly at the end of pop songs, and it's called step up or pump up modulation. Basically, all it is is that after you play the chorus, you repeat it wholesale a whole step up, and because it's higher in everybody's range, the song just sounds brighter. The Hirohashi arrangement of Kaze no Tori Michi that I analyzed in my last video also has an example of this. It's a totally valid device that you can use in your songs when like, I want a climax here um, and I want to signal that super clearly, right? That said, each of these songs do it a little more subtly than your typical pop song does and I personally prefer it. I find it a little more tasteful. One thing I'll point out here is how nicely Kashiwa sets up his transition from B flat to A. 
So he knows he's going to start the A major section on D, the four chord. But first he establishes the new key with E7, the five chord. And then he prepares us for that D with a tritone sub secondary dominant chord and E flat seven. More generally, tonicization using secondary dominant chords like what we've learned here can be used to make these key changes smoother and more gradual. There are actually a couple of key changes in the staff role in the end credits for Ocarina of Time, and Kondo precedes two of them with a 2-5 of the new key that he wants to arrive on. Hisaishi also uses them to great effect in Legend of Ashitaka for Princess Mononoke, but I'll leave that as an exercise for anyone who's interested in checking out my analysis of that song. That's my video today. I hope it had some useful items for you in there. That included some of the last things I noticed about the material from Ocarina of Time. I hope that was useful for you in cementing some of these concepts and having this music that's really familiar for a lot of us to refer back to. I also wanted to say that starting with this Twitter conversation with Kashiwa-san that I included in this video, I'm wanting to start including more discussion on this channel um, about the social context that goes into the composition of these contemporary Japanese works. Sakamoto, for example, has been really prominent in the anti-nuclear protests in Japan. Miyazaki even had this whole saga of coming to terms with post-war Japanese shame um, and integrating what it means to be Japanese and his identity. Alongside cultivating a technical understanding, the intention is to help all of us who resonate with this music to understand its origins and context. And I think including this as part of our journey together is going to help it feel like we're in much more authentic dialogue with this music and where it comes from than if I purely continued to focus on technical aspects. Toward that intention of exploring some of these more sociological aspects of this music, please look out for a video from me in the future um, interviewing ethnomusicology professor Noriko Manabe from Temple University. If that goes well, I'll do more interviews with academics and composers on this channel. I hope that all sounds appealing to you, and if it does, I'll see you in my next video. Until then, jiane.